Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful, blessed day. I want to thank our committee uh, members for coming. Um, they're making their way here. Um, we also have a corrected agenda. There are no virtual speakers, so everyone is in person today. As you can see, we have a full agenda. Um, you know, I would say estimated the first part uh, with everyone should take about two hours, and then we go into hearings. We have our first bill hearing today. So I want to start by just letting you know that this briefing has seven presentations today, including one from the Board of, Nur of Nursing, um, and then we have a bill hearing. So keep that in mind as you ask your questions so that we're not here all day. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to this briefing for the House Health and Government Operations Committee. This is our first session back in person since 2020, so I ask for your patience if we encounter any technical or streaming issues. This briefing is being streamed on the Maryland General Assembly YouTube channel. Um, panelists will control the transition of the slides. Before this briefing, all members will email a copy of each presentation. You were told the time you have. Please adhere to that. If you do not have these documents, please let the committee staff know and we will send you a copy. Please adhere to our usual committee rules of one question and one answer from the panel, not one question and one answer from each panelist. Please keep your questions brief, um, you know, not a story before your question, just the question, please. Um, please keep in mind this briefing is scheduled to conclude a, well, the briefing will, is scheduled to conclude at probably 2 p.m., hopefully, if not 2, what, 3? 3 p.m.? Okay, 3 p.m. <laughs> and then we have a briefing as well. Um, so immediately following the briefing, as I said, we have our first hearing. Today, the Health and Government Operations Committee will hear an overview of the Maryland Health Occupation Boards and the healthcare workforce crisis in Maryland. We will hear from the Commission to study the healthcare work force crisis, the Maryland Hospital Association, the Dwyer Workforce Development Center, and the Public Pathway Program. We will then hear an overview of the Maryland Health Occupations Board with a focus on the Board of Physicians and the Board of Nursing. We will begin with Ms. Kimberly Link, who's the chair of the Commission to Study the Healthcare Workforce Crisis. Ms. Link, um, will you please come up with your panel, if you have one? And before we um, hear from Ms. Link, uh, I would like to wish our wonderful colleague, um, Delegate Nick Kipke, happy birthday. May we tell him happy birthday? And yes, we work on our birthdays. And he's here. Um, so good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Penny Melnick and Vice Chair Kelly and members of the Health and Government Operations Committee. My name is Kim Link. I'm with the Maryland Department of Health, and I am the Senior Advisor to the Secretary on Health Board Matters. It is my honor to have been appointed to serve as the Chair of the Commission to Study the Healthcare Workforce Crisis. I'd like to thank Vice Chair Kelly and Senator Beidle for sponsoring the legislation that created the Commission. I'd also like to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the members of the Commission who have volunteered their time to participate in this very important effort. The Commission has also been very fortunate to have the participation of more than 20 stakeholder organizations and individuals who have provided data and insight into the various healthcare workforce crisis issues. With me today, I have Ms. Casey Tiefenworth. She is the Special Grants Program Manager with the Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning with the Maryland Department of Labor. Ms. Tiefenworth is the Maryland Department of Labor's designee on the commission and also serves as the chair of the Workforce Data Advisory Group. I'm also joined by Dr. Jane Kirschling, Dean of the University of Maryland School of Nursing. Dr. Kirschling holds the commission's seat for representative from the University of Maryland, and she also serves as the chair of the Education and Pathways Advisory Group on the commission. Um, today, the committee will hear from both Ms. Tiefenworth and Dr. Kirschling regarding the work of two, the two advisory groups. I'd like to give you a brief overview of the commission before they speak. The commission is comprised of 24 members and includes four legislators, representatives from state agencies, health occupation boards, and educational institutions. 
the legislation requires the commission to examine 11 key areas regarding the healthcare workforce crisis. I won't list each of them here, um, but I would like to point out a few, and that is um, the commission is, is required to determine the extent of the shortages in different healthcare settings and in different regions of the state. It's also charged with examining the short-term solutions to address immediate needs for these shortages, to examine the ways um, to facilitate career advancement and retention, and to examine ways to incentivize individuals to enter and stay in the healthcare workforce. The scope and the breadth of the mandates that are set forth in the um, legislation are comprehensive. So in order to address those areas in an efficient man manner, the commission established three advisory groups, the Workforce Data Advisory Group, the Education and Pathways Advisory Group, and the State Efficiencies and Cooperation Advisory Group. Members of the commission were assigned to these advisory groups, and stakeholders were invited to join and participate in each meeting of the advisory groups. The advisory groups were tasked with addressing certain aspects of the workforce crisis as outlined in the legislation. Um, shortly after the commission came, came together, the advisory groups uh, began meeting and regularly. They have been researching, collecting, and analyzing data. The commission approved its interim report this past Monday on January 23rd um, that details the work of all of the advisory groups. Um, the report has been submitted to the Office of Governmental Affairs under the Department of Health and will be received by this committee shortly. Um, all of the details of the work that the committee's done over the last seven or eight months are contained in the interim report as well as on the Commission's webpage, and I'd be happy to provide that link um, so that members could see um, all the work that the Commission has done thus far. I'm now going to turn it over to Ms. Tiefenworth, Chair of the Workforce Data Advisory Group, to explain more about what her group has been um, doing over these last several months. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair and Vice Chair Kelly, and to all the members of the committee for having us here today uh, to talk about the work of the commission thus far. Um, as Kim mentioned, my name is Casey Tiefenworth. I am the chair of the Workforce Data Advisory Group, as well as the Special Grants Program Manager for the Maryland Department of Labor Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning. And in that capacity, I oversee um, a portfolio of initiatives related to employment and training for individuals who have been impacted by substance use disorder and addiction, as well as labor's work on supporting job seekers experiencing homelessness. Um, so to start, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the uh, Workforce Data Advisory Group's meeting schedule. As you can see, we had a fairly aggressive bi-weekly meeting schedule, which was voted on by advisory group members, um, during which we held a number of presentations by stakeholders. In September, we heard from public policy partners about school health professionals, and the Maryland Longitudinal Data Systems Center provided an overview of their work and how to submit data requests relevant to the commission. In October, the Maryland Hospital Association and Global Data presented their Maryland Nursing Workforce Study, which I'll reference in more detail later. And we heard from the Maryland Regional Direct Services Collaborative about their report regarding direct service workers in Baltimore City. We did take a break in November um, due to the holidays, but used that time to continue communication with one another and then reconvened in December for work group presentations. So, Due to the vastness of the Commission's charge, we determined that breaking down uh, the Workforce Data Advisory Group into smaller work groups would enable us to make more meaningful progress on data collection. <coughs> Ultimately, we settled on five working groups based on healthcare area or setting, as outlined in the legislation that established the Commission. Each of the work groups was led by a subject matter expert in their field, and their role was to serve as the primary point of contact for their work group members and to collect and review submitted data. Workgroup members were asked to respond to a questionnaire, which is included as an attachment in the interim report, about their access to and ability to provide data related to worker shortages, turnover rates, how the aging of Maryland's population has impacted the healthcare setting or occupation with which they were most closely aligned, information about the impact of reimbursement wages, and the effect that surrounding states had on worker shortages in their particular area 
among other questions geared more towards strategies to recruit, retain, and advance healthcare workers. Um, the leads then reviewed that submitted data and reported pr preliminary findings, which I'll go over today, and also made recommendations about how to improve and or streamline data collection efforts. So the first of these findings was that worker shortages are difficult to determine with currently available data. When the advisory group was asked to submit information they had about workforce shortages, many people responded that they could only provide data that, when taken collectively, could infer shortages for a particular occupation. It was rare that someone had exact data about worker shortages that was specific to Maryland. An exception to this is the Maryland Nursing Workforce Study, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. Another example is that um, uh, using data from various boards, um, or I guess an example of one of the responses that we got was that using data from various boards, we can determine the number of active license holders, but cannot necessarily provide an accurate picture of whether they're currently practicing or simply maintaining their license for future use. We also know that the ability to access data across the boards varies. Keeping in mind, though, that worker shortages take into account multiple factors, including supply and demand, vacancy rates, and turnover. These metrics some kind, sometimes come from multiple disparate sources. Our second finding was that healthcare workforce, uh, the healthcare workforce has experienced or was projected to experience shortages in several key occupations well before the pandemic. I don't think this would come as a surprise to anyone that the entire healthcare workforce took a, a major hit as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, but in reality, the healthcare workforce was already seeing significant shortages or was projected to see shortages that were exacerbated by the strain on the healthcare system. In many ways, COVID-19 sped up the supply and demand issues that were being projected in the, the years immediately preceding the pandemic. Anecdotally, we're hearing that the healthcare, that healthcare workers cite things like safety, lack of flexibility, and wages as their primary reasons for leaving the field following the pandemic. Nursing of all levels is a priority healthcare occupation that is experiencing significant shortages across healthcare settings. We wanted to highlight nursing because nursing care can be found in just about every healthcare setting that was mentioned in the legislation that established the commission. And there does not appear to be one level of nursing that isn't facing some type of shortage. Nurses also tend to bear the brunt of work created by shortages in other healthcare occupations. For example, if there's a shortage of phlebotomists, that may mean that nurses are then drawing blood. Nurses are also increasingly being asked to take on administrative tasks. And so obviously with these additional workload barriers, you can imagine that that could lead to burnout and ultimately attrition from the workforce. In a presentation by the Maryland Hospital Association and Global Data to the Workforce Data Advisory Group, we learned that the most significant need for registered nurses and licensed practical nurses will be in home health, nursing homes, and residential care, which is aligned with the care needed for an aging population. Across almost all healthcare settings, though, the demand for registered nurses and licensed practical nurses would see an average of 19% and 28% growth, respectively. And finally, in terms of our findings, healthcare worker shortages are most pronounced in rural parts of the state. As of November of 2022, the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration has designated 11 Maryland counties as health professional shortage areas, or HIPSAs, uh, just for primary care. All of these 11 counties are considered rural. HIPSAs are federal designations which can be based on geographic area, population, or facility. This information, including a map of primary care HIPSAs, can also be found in the report. It's important to note that nearly every county in the state is experiencing some level of primary care shortage, and if you look at it in terms of mental health, uh, the, uh, HIPS are, the HIPSAs are far worse. However, I don't want to paint this entirely as a doom and gloom scenario. There are some things that are currently being done that I think are important to highlight. Um, and this leads us to recommendations made by uh, the advisory group, the first of which would be to narrow the focus of the commission to a set of critical occupation shortage areas. So the large scope of the commission reflects the severity of the entire healthcare workforce's capacity to withstand current and future demand However, we are recommending that the Commission look at the most critical shortage areas, including nursing, specifically licensed practical nurses, registered nurses and nurse practitioners, primary care, including physicians and physician's assistants, 
certain behavioral health occupations, and certain direct care occupations. We feel that by narrowing our focus, we can dig deeper into the nuances of what the data is telling us about worker shortage trends and how to address them. We're also recommending that we develop a working definition of what it means to have a shortage in those critical occupation areas that is reflective of the needs of Maryland residents rather than relying on federal definitions which may not fully encompass the need in our state. I see sort of one and two as being short-term recommendations, and so another short-term recommendation uh, is that we look to work that's already being done across the state to quantify healthcare workforce shortages. There are several state agencies and active advisory councils who have undertaken this work in some capacity. Examples of this included in the interim report are the Be Behavioral Health Administration's Workforce Survey, which was conducted prior to the pandemic, but showed that the behavioral health field was already woefully understaffed in many critical occupations. The Behavioral Health Administration has taken steps toward uh, mitigating the lack of behavioral health providers by creating scholarship opportunities and specialized training programs at the bachelor's and master's levels. The interim report includes other work currently being undertaken by the State Office of Rural Health and the Department of Labor to bolster the healthcare workforce system. In the, uh, terms of long-term recommendations, um, uh, we're recommending that Maryland's healthcare licensing boards increase the amount and frequency of primary data they collect. This could mean adding questions about demographic information that is collected or even asking licensees to respond to questions about their primary location of practice, how many hours of week, a week they practice there, or even if they have plans to retire within the next five years. This is something that the Workforce Data Advisory Group will continue to explore in 2023. And finally, we feel that the state would benefit from having a central repository of healthcare workforce data. In the interim report, there's a visual that was created by the State Office of Rural Health that shows states who have a healthcare workforce clearinghouse. There's a spectrum of clearinghouse complexities and features, which we are anticipating the State Office of Rural Health um, to release a blueprint uh, that details uh, a, a Maryland blueprint for um, a healthcare clear, uh, clearinghouse sometime this month. The Workforce Data Advisory Group recently held a presentation by Dr. Yeti Shobo, who directs Virginia's healthcare workforce, um, uh, or Virginia's version of a healthcare workforce uh, clearinghouse. And Virginia really serves as the gold standard in comparison to other states. I think we've got a lot that we could learn from Virginia and certainly could look at the work of uh, other states as well to see what might work best for Maryland if we decided to move in this direction. Again, this is definitely something that we plan on exploring more in the upcoming year. Um, Additional next steps include collaboration with the Education and Pathways groups so that data collection informs their strategies to recruit, retain, and advance healthcare workers. We also plan on partnering more closely with the Maryland Longitudinal Dis uh, Data System Center to build out dashboards related to graduation and employment rates for students who obtain an associate's degree or certificate in an allied health profession at Maryland's community colleges, knowing that many uh, graduates of community colleges tend to stay in the area where they went to school. I think we could get a better sense of what that means in terms of the supply um, in a particular region. Eventually, we'll be able to slice this data to learn more about student demographics as well. Uh, and then certainly, we'll continue to examine healthcare workforce shortages based on spoken language and how certain interventions, such as wage increases and career advancement and opportunity, uh, other opportunities, have impacted <coughs> recruitment and retention. Thank you. Do you have anyone else? Yes. Um, Will you do my slides? Sure. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and good thank, afternoon. You to, thank you for your service to the state of Maryland and your uh, interest in the health professions workforce. So I'm Jane Kirschling, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the Education and Pathways Advisory Group, and my day job is to be dean at the University of Maryland School of Nursing. We are both in the Baltimore area as well as at the universities at Shady Grove and Rockville and we have 2,000 plus nursing students at the University of Maryland School of Nursing ranging from those who are entering the profession for the first time to those who are returning to get advanced degrees, including advanced practice nurses. With that as background, in terms of the Education and Pathways Advisory Group, the legislation is very specific about the work that it would like us to do. So we're looking at short-term solutions to address the immediate needs related to the healthcare workforce shortages. 
We're examining the changes that are needed to enhance incentives for individuals to enter and to stay in healthcare in the healthcare workforce. We're examining the methods of improving the transition for active duty and retired military to the civilian healthcare workforce. We are also looking at the barriers that confront foreign born health professionals and identify career and licensure pathways for the refugees and immigrants with the education, training, and experience from other nations who could in fact enter our workforce. We're looking at ways of facilitating career development for the health professions workers and also examining the special needs for Maryland's rural health care system and methods for recruiting and retaining workers in rural areas of Maryland. So to date, the, the advisory group is open to anyone who's interested in participating, whether they're individuals or organizations. We have 50 members of this advisory group, and we've met five times since August of 2022. In addition, we've done 16 informational gathering meetings with myself and staff from the University of Maryland who are helping with this work. The stakeholder, we've done stakeholder presentations to the advisory group, which addressed the foci, and we have more to do. But we have had reports from the Mar on the Maryland's apprenticeship and career programs, on the delivery of primary health care services in the state of Maryland, the delivery of behavioral health care services, we learned about the EARN, which, has Mar which is Maryland's 13 health care grantees to date. We also learned about the Direct Care Workforce Innovation Program, Maryland's workforce development response to addiction and overdose, and also have heard of the barriers for the immigrants who are entering the health care workforce in Maryland. We also have conducted a survey of our health professions licensing bodies to learn more about the licensees that um, come to them and what are some of the barriers that they've been experiencing. And we'll begin the analysis of those survey results later this month. In terms of the, our draft recommendations, we've asked each of the stakeholders to give us what recommendations we should bring forward. And to date, from a primary care standpoint, they would like to see sustainable funding for community preceptor tax programs to include medical, nursing, and physician assistant students. So to incentivize those preceptors to continue to precept because they do it on a voluntary basis for the most part. They also would recommend from a primary care standpoint state funding to create a rural family medicine resident training program on the eastern shore so that if they were, there is a residency program on the Eastern Shore, the likelihood of those individuals staying and practicing there is much, much greater increased. And they would also like to see greater support for the Maryland Health Area Health Education Centers and to include funding for the Central Maryland AHEC, which currently does not receive state funding. In relation to behavioral health, there, the recommendations of the stakeholders who have presented include requiring that Medicaid reimbursement for the collaborative care model be made available. And what this model does is it integrates both physical and behavioral health in primary health care settings. With, there's also a recommendation to sustain and expand the network of certified behavioral health clinics in Maryland in an order to meet the needs for behavioral health. They would also like to see the maintenance and expansion of the use of technology, including extending the provisions of the Preserve Telehealth Access Act of 2021, and to require Medicaid reimbursement for remote patient monitoring. Finally, in relation to behavioral health, they would like to see the establishment of a behavioral health workforce investment fund. There are two additional recommendations to date that the advisory group has heard. One being that for Maryland Department of Labor, healthcare apprenticeships and career programs, that there be additional funding for programs like EARN that, will, uh, that are industry-led and nimble to meet the employer demand. And the second recommendation is to mo modify Maryland's family law, which requires individuals to have a social security number to obtain any kind of license in Maryland, including a fishing license. And this would add and add the option for a tax identification number or TIN. In particular, for nursing, this would allow the Maryland Board of Nursing 
to establish a Maryland-only license for individuals who had a TIN, because currently nurses in Maryland are licensed through the multi-state compact, which requires a social security number. And there is a bill that's been introduced that addresses this area by Senator Kagan, which is Senate Bill 187. So our next steps are to continue meeting with our stakeholders to hear about more of the areas that are covered within the legislation. And we will then draft recommendations, which will come forth to the commission for its deliberation and consideration as it prepares its final report for you um, in 2023. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions you might have. And thank you so much for your work. I know you've been working hard at finding a solution. This is the, one of the most important issues for our leadership, um, I know, and the um, uh, Speaker of the House has stated, you know, the number of vacancy in our workforce. It's a, an issue that this General Assembly will be um, dealing with and trying to find solutions. So adding your voice really helps. So we're going to open it to questions from our members. And the first one is Delegate Kaiser. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, I have a question for the first presentation. Uh, I was looking at the recommendations, and everything was about more and better data which I can certainly get behind, and maybe it was outside of your scope, but did you all have any policy recommendations in terms of, for example, how to get more professionals in these areas or how to get more people into rural areas or anything else? Was that part of the discussion? Um, thank you, Delegate Kaiser. Um, at this moment, um, that was not part of our discussion. We were mainly trying to get a sense of sort of what was out there, um, but I think certainly um, in this upcoming year, we can start to shift our focus more to policy recommendations now that we have a better sense of the lay of the land, if you will. Thank you. We have Delegate Collison followed by Delegate Hill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Um, Dr. Kirschling, uh, thank you for your work. Um, just a quick question. The um, recommendation that we look at 10 folks who have 10 numbers or 10s, we would maintain our standard of um, professional knowledge and expertise, right? We're not diminishing that in any way. It simply is opening it to a group of people who are equally qualified but may not have a Social Security number. Absolutely. They would have graduated from the appropriate programs and have the appropriate credentials. There is a group of individuals for whom pursuing a Social Security number raises some concerns for them. And occasionally they do apply to my school of nursing, and I have to share with them that they either have to get a Social Security number or they need to find another state that allows for another mechanism for licensure. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delegate Hill. Chair, and thank you all for the work and for the presentation. Um, Dr. Kirschling, uh, when we talk about um, incentivizing folks for the workforce, as I recall, we had some programs to encourage um, nurses to do rural work some years ago that we ended up closing because the funds weren't spent because nobody was picking up the incentives. So how are you approaching not, you know, looking at incentives that people actually are willing to do. In other words, it's not just more money. There's something else that's missing that makes, right, that people aren't taking the incentives when we offer them. Yes, yeah, so it's something that I can bring back to the advisory group to have further deliberation about in terms of fine-tuning what that looks like, in terms of what, in today's market, what, what are the incentives that are most appealing to individuals. Besides money. Well, one never knows. I post Post-COVID, some people may actually be hoping for some more money, but it's, a, it's an interesting challenge in terms of how do, how do we do this. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chairman, um, and thank you to everybody who has been involved in this work. I, I truly want to thank you because it has been a tremendous um, uh, amount of work that you all have done since this started, and I'm really, really appreciative, um, especially to Kim, for all the work you've been doing. Um, but my question was a follow-up to, to Casey, a follow-up to Delegate Kaiser's question, because I did um, 
recently go to the NCSL Southern Region um, Conference on the healthcare workforce, and I know Georgia has a healthcare commission, and there are a couple of other states who have been doing this as well. And what I heard from them was similar to what I'm hearing from you all, which was two things in general. Number one, our commission wasn't able to do anything in the first year other than focus on nursing because nursing is on fire. Um, and number two, the first problem we faced was that our data is no good. And so I think, and I think I see this embedded in the recommendations to Delegate Kaiser's point, that, that the, the point of getting the data is so that we can solve for the other problems. And the policy solutions that you're recommending are make it so that we have better data. And there's some things we can do, such as enable and or require the boards to get us better data. Um, you know, that there are, there are data-related policy solutions that we need to be looking at right now in order to get that first step moving. Is that right, Kate? And also, thank you for bringing the Department of Labor perspective into this conversation, because I think those of us who've been working for a few years known that sort of this partnership is needed to happen, so I'm so excited it's happening. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so yes, I, I appreciate you clarifying that. So um, yeah, in terms of um, sort of getting at better data and what sort of policy recommendations we can make around that, um, obviously if we wanted to move forward with the recommendation related to uh, more and more frequent um, primary uh, data collected from the boards, that, that certainly could be one thing. But um, I, I agree with sort of what, what you've heard. I don't think Maryland sits outside of the sort of experience of other states in terms of um, you know, what's happening right now with the healthcare workforce crisis and the data that we can point to that really gives us a true and accurate picture of it. Um, I think this commission and the work that's already being done in many ways is the first step towards um, sort of mitigating those challenges. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you on behalf of the committee for being with us today. We really appreciate your time. Next panel is the Maryland Hospital Association, and we have Mr. Ed Loburn, CEO of St. Anne's. Maryland Hospital Association Task Force Chair, Ms. Nicole Stallings, Executive Vice President of MHA. And Ms. Stallings, congratulations are in order for your new position on behalf of the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chair uh, Penya Melnick and Vice Chair Kelly uh, and the members of this committee. Thank you for your service. My name is Ed Lovern, and I'm the president and CEO of Ascension St. Agnes, and I've also had the privilege of getting to serve as the chair of the MHA's Workforce Task Force. Uh, the task force came together last fall uh, to study and make recommendations to address the hospitals and the healthcare field's top concern, which is workforce shortages. The task force, which continues to meet is made up of hospital executives, nursing leaders, HR leaders, uh, and we have explored the current challenges, identified future trends, shared best practices, discussed necessary policy changes and operational adjustments, and ultimately released a report and recommendations in August. And I'm going to talk about some of the statewide data, and then Nicole is going to walk through the recommendations at a high level. Um, the workforce shortages, as we, we've heard already from the first group, um, predate the pandemic, but we have lacked adequate statewide data to fully understand the challenges that our field, the hospital field, and, and the health fields um, have been facing. So one of the first actions of our task force was to approve a quarterly workforce survey among the hospitals uh, so that the MHA could quantify the staffing pressures that hospitals were facing. So the, the data show that the shortages are across the state and impacting every hospital uh, in Maryland, with one in five hospital positions being vacant at the time of the survey. Um, the task force acknowledged early on uh, that while shortages were across all employee groups, um, that we needed to focus, and as um, as um, Vice Chair Kelly already said, uh, nursing is on fire. So uh, it was clearly nursing that is that is caught our, t our attention or caught our uh, need to act. Um, they make up the biggest portion of our employees. Um, they also have a one in four vacancy rate compared to the one in five that I talked about. 
um, before uh, for all of uh, hospital workers. So the MHA commissioned a report to better understand the extent and the reasons for the nurse shortage and to try to figure out an adequate uh, pathway to get to us to an adequate supply of nurses in the future. Uh, the data uh, showed that we have, we're, we're at this point 5,000 RNs short uh, for hospitals needs alone and we'll have a shortfall of nearly 14,000 nurses in 2035 at our current rate. And likewise, we have an estimated 4,000 LPN uh, that we're short at this point, uh, with that number cli climbing to 9,200 by 2035. Um, the next slide is uh, a bit more data uh, from these demand projections. And while this report was commissioned by the Hospital Association, it was important for us uh, that we looked at the supply and demand of projections across the healthcare continuum in all settings. At the height of the pandemic and now, we acutely feel shortages in other settings because it causes patients to wait in our emergency departments and stay in our inpatient beds uh, beyond when they are cleared for discharge. And as you can see on the slide, uh, based on the aging population, the disease burden, and, and how care uh, was utilized before COVID, Maryland is projected to need over 5,400 additional RNs in the inpatient setting, which is a 20% increase in demand. Um, but I want to draw people's attention to the post-acute settings, and again, the previous group addressed this, that uh, it's, it's home health, it's nursing homes, and it's residential care um, that show actually a proportional bigger uh, increase in demand and a, and a higher gap in the outgoing years. Uh, we see this trend as we look at the LPNs on the next slide as well. Uh, the post-acute settings face a significant projected shortfall of LPNs uh, with nursing homes and residential care, uh, seeing an increase in demand of over 50% in the next 15 years. Inpatient care will see a 20% increase in demand, uh, but it's important to note that that doesn't uh, reflect new care models. Currently, hospitals don't tend to use a lot of LPNs. We're now, most hospitals are beginning to explore how to incorporate LPNs into their care model, um, but obviously that would then make the increase in demand in the future uh, go even higher for hospitals and, and exacerbate what's happening in some of the other um, settings of care. Um, so we continue to focus on not just nurses, but also the nurse extenders, uh, positions like LPNs, uh, certified nurse assistants, patient care technicians, and others uh, that are related to that. Uh, this is our last data slide, and there's a lot going on here, but I want to show that as you, as you progress from the status quo scenario, uh, which is the one second uh, from the left, uh, which is the, the current situation or as we projected it, and you would, you would even increase um, the number of scenarios uh, or the number of graduates by 10%, which is the second column from the end. So if you could, if you could wave a magic wand and increase the supply by 10%, um, more than what we're projecting at this point, we still end up at about 85% of demand um, in, in 2035. And LP, LPN supply meets only 45% uh, of demand in 2035. Uh, so we can't grow enough nurses in the short term to get out of this crisis. And you're going to hear more recommendations, or you're going to hear recommendations um, on opportunities to use new care models and ensure that we are retaining the workforce. So I'll turn it to Nicole at this point. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ed, and thanks for your leadership on this. So what I wanted to do um, at a very high level was talk through the process that got us to the recommendations for this report. We have included the links to our full report um, in this slide deck, as well as to the full report from Global Data, uh, which did a lot of the analysis that, that Ed just walked through. So in being informed by that data, uh, being informed by executive interviews that we did with all of our hospitals and also by a series of focus groups that we did with nurses, newer nurses and those that had been in, um, in, in health careers and hospital careers for some time, we identified three primary challenges, which you see here on the top of the slide. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but at a high level, I will say, first and foremost, no surprise, high staff turnover. We really were at a perfect storm. We had um, an aging population, we had retirements, we had, of course, 
course, COVID burnout. Uh, we had um, opportunities for remote work and alternative settings. All of these things together were really driving high uh, staff turnover. We also know that our patients want care to be delivered in different ways, in different settings. There are opportunities to use staff differently, but we do not have the healthcare workforce currently to really uh, take on those new delivery models. And then finally, an insufficient nursing pipeline. And as uh, Ed said, you know, we know we can't grow our way out of that, but there are things that um, could be done, not just to enhance the interest uh, of, of individuals to enter healthcare fields, hospital fields, nursing, um, but also to ensure that we have the appropriate faculty and clinical sites to, to meet that demand. And then finally, we realized we still need to um, have a very comprehensive effort to enhance the diversity of our workforce. That patient provider concordance is essential as we look at our um, opportunities to really affect disparities and, and advance health equity in this state. And so those challenges together then rolled um, up to identify the four recommendations that you see at the bottom of this slide. And underneath each of those, we identified a series of action items. Our report um, highlights recommendations for three core groups. At the back, what is MHA gonna do as, as the Trade Association for Maryland's Hospitals? This starts with a digital marketing campaign focused on enhancing the diversity of our workforce, really targeting underrepresented individuals, um, but also the partnerships that we have with community colleges, our HBCUs, and other institutions of higher ed. Um, what are our hospitals and our health systems going to do to retain the workforce, to really um, uh, grow local workforce development opportunities. Those are partnerships with middle schools and high schools and, and community colleges and more. But what I wanna quickly step through are the recommendations for policymakers that you uh, see here. So first on expanding our nursing pipeline, we've talked a lot about um, incentives that could be used. <laughs> Um, to really grow that workforce and also the need for coordination and accountability at a statewide level. We've talked a lot about data and, um, uh, and, and really having that ownership opportunity with a state agency to set recommendations and ensure, or an entity, to ensure that we are meeting um, those recommendations and have the workforce that we need in the future. But I would draw your attention to the two recommendations um, at the, the, the third and fourth recommendations here because I haven't heard those yet. We have qualified healthcare professionals in our state right now that we could tap. And so there are things that we need to do, um, certainly around internationally trained providers, but also what more can we do? We call it our green to blue strategy. What is that campaign for those that are in the military or soon to be retiring and really leveraging the proximity of the, of the various bases that we have? Second, to remove barriers to health education. We know those educational pathways um, aren't on everything that they, that they can be. It's important to address the front end of um, having students come into um, these settings. And, and you see with some of the rationale on the bottom of the slide, 20% of nursing students will drop out with the highest rate observed after their first semester. So what are the wraparound services that our students need? I was a first generation college student. I can tell you if I did not have supports for transportation and books and other incentives, I would not have been able to make it happen and to finish school. And we need to provide those same sorts of wraparound services on the front end, which are just as important as the loan repayment on the back end that this body is very well aware of. And the dean already spoke to the need to focus on preceptors and, um, and other opportunities around instructors retaining our healthcare workforce. We need to make sure that we're keeping individuals in the, the healthcare field and in, in hospitals. And again, what are those social and economic drivers? COVID showed us this. When we look at who left the workforce during COVID, it was mostly women. And why was it women? Because they had childcare responsibilities. They had elder care responsibilities. They had kids that they needed to support. And so what are those social and economic drivers that are uh, very much part of now our healthcare vernacular, our workforce development needs? And then also, I, I can't um, underscore, I think we talked about workplace violence at every single meeting. 
and we have looked at different ways to address this. It's unfortunately seems to continue to grow um, across our, our organizations. And, and last year, this body passed legislation to um, create a, an awareness campaign, and that group has been meeting and has recommendations. We'd like to see that campaign get launched, but this continues to be a real driver uh, when we look at opportunities to retain our workforce. And then finally, on new care models, this comes down to uh, leveraging our existing workforce. So looking certainly at scope of practice, but also ensuring that we are not having state borders be arbitrary barriers and we can have access to providers back forth with the district in Virginia and our neighboring states. We believe there is more that can be done there. And so I will um, conclude by saying, you know, I'll, a recap is, the shortages were here before the pandemic. They have certainly been exacerbated by the conditions of the pandemic. There is no silver bullet. There's not an instant remedy. We believe that our report um, lays out a multi-year plan to start to um, address uh, these challenges. These are our three workforce priorities this session. Um, I want to focus on the recommendation in the middle for just a, a moment, and then we'll take your questions. Um, and I know that we are being followed by uh, our health occupations boards. I want to start off by saying um, and thanking uh, Ms. Evans and the staff at the Maryland Board of Nursing who have worked very closely with the hospital association over the past 18 months. Bi-weekly meetings, meeting with our chief nursing officers monthly, our HR leaders, there's been a very high degree of collaboration, and that's because there has to be. And they're gonna talk about um, how they're under-resourced, and we agree. And they are going to talk about how they're understaffed, and we agree. Where we might disagree is what needs to be done to ensure that uh, the Board of Nursing and our health occupations boards, but our focus is with the Board of Nursing, is really the, um, the entry way to careers in healthcare and not a barrier. And so I, I would uh, welcome opportunities to talk about opportunities um, there. Um, I will conclude just with one last slide. This is our digital marketing campaign. It's launching in two weeks. Uh, join mdhealth.org. You will hear more about it, but um, we are very excited and, and working closely with our community college and HBCU partners to, to launch this campaign, and, and um, you, we hope we'll see it and help to spread the word. And so with that, Madam Chair, we are happy to take any questions. Thank you, and good afternoon. And I just want to say um, I do appreciate the work that we have done in the interim. I know that I have personally called you a lot, <laughs> the Maryland Hospital Association, and uh, also for the Mr. Um, uh, Loburn, the CEO of St. Agnes, can you tell the committee where is St. Agnes located and how many beds um, do you have? We are in uh, West Baltimore uh, City, about a mile from the county line, and, and probably if you look at a map, you, it, we're close to Catonsville. Uh, so that's the general area, and we have uh, 242 licensed beds. So we're truly uh, in the scope of hospitals. We're a small hospital in the city, uh, relatively a, a mid-sized hospital overall. How long have you been there? I've been there about two and a half years. Okay. Thank, thank you, and thank you for being here. We, we appreciate you. We do have thank questions. You. Yes, we do have questions. We're going to start with uh, Delegate Shalega, followed by Delegate Rosenberg, followed by Delegate Woods and then Delegate Hutchinson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here. So um, yes, I think we all know uh, that there's a, a healthcare worker shortage, but um, I, in the um, presentation on page three and four, with uh, demand for RNs by setting, demand for LPNs by setting, I see academia um, six, you know, ha is on a, a zero percent growth on on both of those fronts. So I'm assuming that means there are not enough, or uh, no, I would say not enough. There is not an increase in teachers in these programs. Is that what that means? Yes. Okay. So you know, then if I go back to page nine. The removal, remove barriers to health care education. Um, I'm surprised I'm not seeing on here anything about increasing available spots in nursing programs and LPN programs. I have, you know, lots of friends in nursing and, you know, those of us that 
have kids in the, you know, post K to 12 system, I can't tell you how many stories we hear about people who want to get into nursing, but, you know, of, I'm making these numbers up, 200 people apply for the program and they only have slots for 100 and those 100 that don't get in are highly qualified. What are we, I, I didn't see that on here, maybe I missed it. Uh, you, you did not miss it in this abbreviated version. It is in our report as one of the key challenges, and I think we have the statistic around um, uh, in 2020, 80,521 80, qualified nursing applicants were not accepted at schools of nursing due to the shortage of clinical sites, faculty, and other resource constraints, to your very, very good point. And you so, said 80,000? Yes, this is national. This is a national number, but 80,000. So these are individuals who are ready. They are ready to go, they are qualified, but because of uh, constraints and clinical sites and the need for more faculty, they have to be turned away. And so we think this is a real opportunity um, um, uh, with, in partnership with the, the schools to enhance these numbers. So I, I hope I, that make, makes its way up on the list because you want more nurses and LPNs and healthcare workers 80,000 of them want to join the ranks. Great point, and I will note in the recommendations for our hospitals and health systems, one of the very first recommendations is create more clinical sites for our hospitals that we can then partner with. So, and we've yes, been talking absolutely. about, I've been on this committee six, seven years. We've been talking about this for seven years. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we have an opportunity to uh, work on it this session. Um, thank you. Delegate Woods, followed by Delegate Rosenberg. Okay, it was the other way around initially. Am I? I can go ahead. Oh, was it? It was Delegate Rosenberg first. Okay. Well, thank you for being so kind. Mm -hmm. Delegate Rosenberg, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Woods. Point of personal privilege first and then a question. Mr. Laverne, as you may know, you're new to my district under the new line. St. Agnes is in my district, and I've been remiss in not meeting you before now, so I look forward to visiting the hospital whether during session or afterwards, so thank you. Uh, loan repayment is an issue that I've been involved with over the years, and it's listed as one of the needs for nurses. Could you be spe more specific ab about what the need is, and will, you, will there be any legislation this session? Um, there was legislation last session to establish a loan repayment program for nurses and nurses assistants. The details of that are still being worked out. I'm pleased to say that Governor Moore's budget included funding for the nurse lo loan repayment program as well as uh, physicians, and we think that's there's a real opportunity. Loan repayment is a proven tool. When you uh, get individuals to underserved areas, you provide them with these resources. The data show they stay there. And so we certainly want to make sure that that's available to not just our physicians but also our nurses. Okay, thank you. The amazing, kind Delegate Woods. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you so much for your presentation. Several, well, many, several years ago, um, I was a part of the Maryland Council for New Americans, um, established by Governor O'Malley, to talk about how we could integrate immigrants who were licensed and credentialed to work um, in these areas where there were gaps in healthcare. And I'm just curious if that has any way been uh, looked at, um, because at least at that time, there were many immigrants in this country who had the licenses and credentials, and we were just looking at ways to get them moved through the system quicker to meet the immediate need. I believe Dean Kirschling spoke to this opportunity as well with respect to the Social Security numbers, and mm -hmm. we know there will be legislation. Um, uh, Senator Kagan and I believe Delegate Lopez as well uh, will be introducing that legislation, which we will certainly be engaged in. Okay. Um, we think this is a critical opportunity, again, to leverage everyone who has the skills and uh, the, the passion and the mission for caring uh, available in our state. So we will support that legislation and any other opportunity we can. Thank you so much. And if I may, um, Delegate Olsten is watching from home. She's a little bit under the weather. And she sent me um, a question just now. And she said, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Question for the panel is sort of related to Delegate Woods. Are there any efforts to allow immigrants who have license from their country of origin to um, be allowed to practice here? 
Um, so we are working closely exploring all options. I do believe the social security number tends to be a, a real impediment, so I would say that's the primary focus at this time. We and our task force have also identified language requirements. We want to ensure that we are not holding um, Marylanders to a higher language prof uh, English proficiency standard than our neighboring states, so that might also be something to look into in the future. Okay, thank you. Next we have Delegate Hutchinson followed by Delegate Collison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think this uh, question is for um, Nicole or Nostalgia, right? Uh, it's actually, um, Delegate Shalega brought it up earlier, and the thing that jumped out to me in this whole entire presentation was that 80,000 number of applicants that can't get through. Before today, I thought the issue was millennials or professionals didn't want to go into the nursing profession. so. I'm really surprised there wasn't more about that and how we can address that issue, and I look forward to working with everybody on, on solving that. You said that 80,000 is a national number. Do we have any idea, Maryland-wise? So? Um, I, I do not, Delegate. Uh, perhaps Dean Kirschling would be able to, to speak to that or provide that information to the committee. She was telling us uh, prior to um, uh, the, the hearing convening that we actually are seeing an interest in um, applicants to our schools of nursing. We're seeing that decline as well. And so we really do have work there, to your point, where you thought what you thought you were going to hear about, we are hearing that is also um, a problem. But we're happy to, to work with the dean, and perhaps there could be some follow-up to your specific question. Thank you. Will you be so kind and work with the dean and anyone else to get that information to the committee? Make sure you send it to our staff and the entire committee as well. Thank you so much. Next, we have Delegate, actually, um, Delegate Collison, followed by Vice Chair Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a good follow-up to uh, Delegate Hutchinson's question. So I think um, there probably is a different approach to career choices and desires in this millennial plus the Gen Z. And I heard um, in the first presentation that lack of flexibility just job flexibility, and I don't know what that means exactly. I have a sense, but I don't know what exactly it means. Um, but I'm wondering if in your recommendations you were considering different ways of um, assignments or timing and scheduling that would, would provide some of that, flexi that kind of um, flexibility and perhaps a little autonomy in the nursing profession that might um, number one, get those younger people in, and number two, keep them. Yes, uh, Dr. Collison, or uh, Delegate Collison. I'm used to calling everybody doctors. So that's why, yeah. it, it always serves me well if I start off with that. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, you know, and I think one of the things that was interesting with the task force was we recognized that there were a lot of things that were uh, somewhat proprietary of, of how we tried to retain employees and retract employees, uh, but there was also a good culture of sharing a lot of that stuff and talking about it. And I think we've, I, I work for a large system, Ascension, and I think um, all hospitals have recognized that that's a a key pathway is uh, the we we the pendulum swings back and forth, and so it swung in an area where it got very convenient to have everybody work 12-hour shifts. Uh, that's a three-day work week for people. It's a lot of good things about that, um, but it's not working uh, as well as it maybe it never worked that well. But it's not working well now. We've got to be more creative in the way that we um, we think about what employees need and. Um, uh, and also just thinking of some of the wraparound services that we talked about, the things that we can support people. And um, like everything, it's slower to evolve than I want it to be. You know, it's, I think it's, um, and it's got a price tag, but, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we recognize now is the cost of, um, I, I think if there's been a, in some ways a healthy, a helpful thing that's happened with this whole increase in labor costs resulting from the uh, agency um, increase, which is, you know, we, we've seen a big increase in what we've spent for nursing. It's realizing we're spending that much, it's made us more creative in thinking about, well, what could we be doing differently uh, in order to retain nurses and attract nurses instead of, you know, spending multiples of what we used to spend by getting them through agencies. So um, that's coming, I, but like I said, I wish it was happening faster. And I think the the, the great thing about the, the task force was the collaboration, and I think it's being relatively new to Maryland. I was very impressed with the, that 
the collaborative culture of Maryland hospitals in the interest of sharing a lot and not worrying so much about if something is proprietary and a, and a competitive advantage or not. Thank you for your reference. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. And I just want to um, let the committee know that it is now 2 o'clock. We have one, two, three more panels, and the bill hearings at 3. So just keep in mind, if there's something that you can get offline, please be so kind and request it. They're wonderful. And the information that we need offline, if you can send it to our council, Ms. Rode, and she'll send it to the committee, okay? And she put this together today and did a wonderful job, by the way. Next, we have Vice Chair Kelly, followed by Delegate Hill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. And I will be brief, and I appreciate the work that everybody has done on this space. I think this question is good for Nicole. Um, but it, So the 80,000 number that we've been throwing around, I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, that is an RN number, not, not inclusive of LPNs and CNAs and patient care techs, correct? Nursing student number, so entering schools of nursing. So yes. So I would. that would be for folks looking for those RN positions, which is, while a shortage area, not the correct. biggest shortage area. Correct. So the biggest shortage area that you guys have identified in your report is the LPN because you don't use a lot of CNAs, but you do use patient care. Can you explain to me what hospitals use and then how that shifting model of what hospitals are using impacts the other you know, other employers in the healthcare space that you sort of hinted at? Sure. Uh, currently, we use mostly, uh, for, for nursing and nursing support, we use mostly RNs. And, and again, the crisis has pushed hospitals to begin to rethink. Um, again, everything is cyclical, so we're coming back to thinking about RNs. Um, and the, the increase was larger with the LPNs, but the, the actual number um, it currently is still with the RNs. I mean, so, so the LPNs had a larger increase, um, but, um, but right now it's, it, we, we, don't, we don't use them as, as much as we um, have in the past. We've gone to more. There was really a, a, a shift in the industry to, to push uh, the RN model, um, probably starting about 10 or 15 years ago with the magnet programs and things like that that really pushed an RN-only model. Now we're rethinking that. And so in the, in the rethinking that, then you would be potentially hiring more LPNs, which then would normally become, would come maybe from long-term care facilities or other folks who are employing those folks and put pressure on those industries? That's the concern, right, that is um, we're, we're able probably to hire, you know, for, other, for various reasons. Sometimes we can hire people away from those settings, which is, um, doesn't work well ultimately for us, uh, because then when we need to send them to those settings, they, they, they're not staffed sufficiently, um, and it doesn't work well for the population. So um, it, it is an emerging area where we need to focus more on, on how we grow that occupation. And then just Sorry, Madam yeah. Chairman, just to clarify, it was the first part of my question, so it's not another question. Yeah. It's okay. I am, I'm allowing it because this is an important issue mm -hmm. that this committee is going to be dealing with a couple of big bills. And I think that the background is important. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for the layway. So can you just explain to us how hospitals use the patient care tech and how that's a little bit different from a CNA and how they're related? Yeah, and, I th it's, it, and it differs among hospitals. And it, and it, but right now, um, the tech is used primarily to get vitals and, um, and provide support. They, um, typically, they have less training. Um, so they're, they usually have a higher number of patients that they're taking care of versus the nurse, uh, and they're going through and they're getting the vitals and, um, and, and doing, you know, taking care of needs of the patients. The LPNs fit somewhere in between that, and again, that's um, part of the new challenge where we're trying to figure out exactly what that, um, how that skill mix works, how that care model works, which is um, also new ground to, you know, given the last time LPNs were used a lot in hospitals may have been 15, 20 years ago. And so with technology and everything else, we're really beginning to, we have to reconfigure how the whole model works. And, and so and I'm going back to Nicole, because this was yeah. my original point of my sure. question. Thank you for walking us through that. How You kind of referenced delays and inefficiencies in the licensing process. So how do those delays and inefficiencies for all those different professions that we just talked about impact hospitals? <laughs> They impact our ability to have um, uh, care at the bedside. 
And so if you are a CNA or an LPN or an RN and your license is being held up, that means you're not on the floor. And um, as we've seen surges throughout the pandemic or with RSV and flu, we've had to make urgent calls to all of the boards, frankly, to say, hey, we need some expedited consideration here. And some boards are able to accom uh, accommodate that more than others. Thank you. And thank you for being patient and the committee as well. Um, Delegate Hill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try and be brief. Uh, I, 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 and I think this is for Nicole. Um, obviously, if we don't ask the right questions, we won't get the right answers. So I know that we're doing a lot in nursing in terms of coming up with other ways of teaching, online teaching, accelerated courses, and all of that kind of stuff, and taking people in from different routes. When you do these studies, are we looking and asking the questions about whether the nature of nursing itself, not simply the pandemic, it's what's causing the burnout, so whether corporate models are so malaligned with the reason people go into healthcare that people are not staying in the profession? regardless of pay incentives? Um, I think one of the most uh, valuable things that we did were our nursing focus groups. And there it was, unvarnished. What, you know, what uh, the, the views around um, readiness of new nurses, of administrative burden for paperwork, and, you know, how many clicks is it taking me with the EMR, and are there opportunities there? And so in the set of recommendations for hospitals and health systems, this is front and center. These are the conversations that we need to have, and we do believe there are some opportunities with um, our institutions of higher education, too, to make sure that when we're getting nurses, they're ready. Um, and, and we had some concerns around the table uh, about that as well. So there's a lot to do there, Delegate Hill. It's more in the hospital and health system recommendations than what we presented today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Seeing no other questions, I just want to thank you for your time, for your patience, and have a blessed day. Thank you for the work. I'm sure I'll see you soon. Next, we have the next panel, and remember, we have three left. So as you ask your question, only one question, please. And don't feel like you have to ask every panel. Um, the next one is Dwyer Workforce Development Center, Barb Clapp, CEO. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Good. Um, and you can get started. Hello, everybody, and thank you for having me here today. Um, we've heard how uh, catastrophic this healthcare crisis, staffing crisis is. And what Dwyer Workforce Development is doing is trying to address the staffing crisis. Um, our motto is education is the best medicine. So um, our. Not advancing where we want. Okay. Who are we? Um, our mission is to help people who lack opportunity improve the healthcare staffing crisis and improve the lives of seniors. You saw that um, staffing in the senior facilities is, is worse than ever, and with the aging population that we have, it's going to be just a tsunami of problems that come with it. Um, so what we're trying to do is solve that problem. Jack Dwyer, who is the patron of our not-for-profit, Dwyer Workforce Development, is the founder of CFG Bank and CFG Funding. Um, you may have heard a lot about CFG Bank late, lately because we're moving down to um, Port Covington, um, our corporate offices down there, and we're also now the C CFG Bank Arena. Jack is a extraordinarily successful businessman, but he also gives back to our community in huge ways. And um, he wanted to start this not-for-profit because he saw firsthand the staffing crisis um, in the healthcare world. I am um, a longtime friend of, friend of Jack's, and also he was my client for eight years when I owned my um, uh, national marketing firm. We focused on education, healthcare, not-for-profit, and uh, corporate work. And he, when I sold my company, tapped me to start this not-for-profit and grow it. 
So what we do is we train people who lack opportunity to be CNAs. Um, we pay for their education as CNAs, and then we give them an opportunity to increase their credentials. They can become um, p techs, med techs, that kind of thing after a year. Um, and then we give them a career ladder to LPN and RN if they choose to go that way. But what we do know is if you're a person that lacks opportunity, if you don't, you can, I can train them over and over again, but if I don't remove the barriers to their success in employment, they're not going to be successful. So what we do and what we've changed about um, the training model is we provide comprehensive case management. I have LCSWCs on staff who work with our CNAs from the minute that they apply to our program. And we address right up front, what are the things that you might have problems with in being successful in your training? Um, do you have children? Yes. Do you have childcare? No. So if they say no, we try to address that with um, comprehensive wraparound services. So we'll help them find childcare, we'll help pay for the childcare. Um, or whatever it is, if it's transportation, we can get bus vouchers. We, if it's um, ability to get scrubs, we provide those. If they don't have a laptop, we give, it, give that to them. Um, so what are the barriers? Basically, um, it's difficulties using technology, struggling with literacy, no knowledge of where to get training or lack of a degree, unable to afford the cost. So we're addressing those issues. Housing. Um, housing is one of the biggest challenges, a safe place to live. Um, we had a Dwyer scholar um, that wanted to go to her training, and she was in a domestic violence, violence episode the night before, and somebody knocked down her front door. And her mother and her child were in the house, and she couldn't go to work because she didn't feel safe leaving them. So we addressed it by going and fixing her door. Um, we also um, don't, the people that we train don't have a career path. They have limited experience. They lack professional knowledge or experience job searching. Um, they are undeveloped soft skills, lack of work culture, understanding physical and mental health issues. Um, and then financial literacy is a big problem. Um, if you get a, a paycheck, how do you manage it? How do you make good decisions? Wise decisions about money? And these are all barriers that we work on every day with our scholars. We call our, Dwyer, our scholars Dwyer scholars. Um, as you know from the previous presentation, 94% of nursing homes need staff now. Um, it is critical to patient care. And CNAs are the people that have the eyes on our parents. And they notice if um, Mrs. Green doesn't eat her Jello that day, and Mrs. Green loves Jello. Um, so they're critical to fixing this staffing shortage. Um, 79% of caregivers cited burnout as a top personal challenge. So one of the things that we're working with them on is making sure that we know while we're case managing them, and we do case manage them for two years into their um, career process, whether they are getting burned out. So we created a Dwyer Scholar app for our CNA trainees, and they are able to give a thumbs up for their day at work or a thumbs down for their day at work. And if we see three or four th thumbs down, we know that there's an issue. Um, we also offer them all kinds of um, vouchers for um, whatever they may need on their app. And then we tell them about camp opportunities, how to get their taxes done, those kinds of things. Um, I talked a little bit how we do it. Um, we offer free CNA and GNA courses. We do um, comprehensive wraparound services, job placement services, and case management. And we do have what we created. Uh, we created an employer collaboration. And we make sure that the employers that we have agreements with um, agree to treat our CNAs a certain way so that they remain in their positions and remain happy in their positions and communicate with us if they feel they aren't, things aren't going well. Um, we start with the funding. Um, I, do, I am a not-for-profit, so I do actively search for funds. Um, I do private fundraising. I have grants. I get money from foundations. I actually have a state-earned grant, which I'm really happy about. Um, and then, fortunately, we have a dedicated funding source 
through um, an acquisition that we made of skilled nursing facilities, uh, a portfolio of skilled nursing facilities, and they are now not-for-profit skilled nursing facilities, and the money they throw off we also use to fund our not-for-profit. So we are fortunate that we do have resources to do what we're doing. Some of the things that we've seen that are really important are emergency grants, housing assistance, transportation stipends, child care support, case management, and mentorship. Um, of course, um, child care was mentioned earlier. That is one of the biggest issues of our Dwyer scholars. Um, and we're, we also provide child care and camps and drop-in child care, those kinds of things. We do encourage our Dwyer scholars to move on um, to nursing school. Um, after a year, they can apply for nursing school, but many of our scholars do not have the um, background to move right to nursing school. So we have enrichment programs that we work with them on to help them get there, as well as give them stack stackable credentials so that they can get to that um, end game if they choose. That's just a sample of some of our partners. Um, many of our partners come from other not-for-profits. So we might work with Presley Ridge that helps children aging out of foster care that would like to go into the nursing profession. Bridges Baltimore that um, works with kids in Title I schools in Baltimore City who might want a career in uh, health care. We work with Helping, Us, Helping Up Mission, which helps with people that are formerly addicted. Um, we work with House of Ruth domestic violence. So we have a great pipeline of people coming in, and then also we work with the different workforce boards throughout the state to get, get our um, Dwyer scholars, and we have no problem with the pipeline of people. Um, we also are looking at the bigger picture um, besides affordable childcare. We are working on apprenticeship programs. Um, collective impact by working with other not-for-profits. We're, we're working with Urban Alliance right now to try to address all kids in, in Baltimore City Schools. Um, we're looking at culture solutions. We're doing um, recruiting with military and colleges, um, which was all, like, like military and colleges, but also in the military, which was referenced earlier. Um, and then we are going to create a holistic healthcare village, which is we're looking to build housing in different parts of the state. Right now, we're looking at West Baltimore and East Baltimore and creating um, affordable housing with child care on site um, and any other, or elder care perhaps, any other kinds of solutions that we can to create a village that creates a safe space for people so they can go to work. Um, and then we're doing active marketing of the, <coughs> the uh, value of a, a health care career. So our first year, which was this past year, we trained 287 Dwyer scholars in Maryland. We have a 95% retention rate, and we credit that uh, to the wraparound services. Um, we are in Texas now. That's where the portfolio we acquired is. We plan on training 350 to 400 scholars in Maryland this year and 700 in Texas. So we'll be well over 1,000 scholars by the time uh, this year ends. Thank you. Do you have any questions? We're going to hold on to the questions um, because we have one of our speakers that needs to leave, be somewhere by 2.30. So if you will be so kind, I promise we will give you our full attention and allow him to come up. Oh, sure. Yes, Absolutely. thank you so much. Okay. So next, um, I would like to call on the, the Public Health Pathways Program, the Honorable Johnny Olszewski, the County Executive of Baltimore County. <laughs> used to serve with us <laughs> very proud of you very proud of you Madam Chair thank you President uh, <laughs> wait too long on you so I appreciate it oh, and I definitely don't want that <laughs> <laughs> Um, but good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Pena Melnick, Vice Chairwoman Kelly, and I want to especially thank you for your conversations about the work that we're doing and your interest in this, um, but to all the members of the Health and Government Operations Committee, 
Uh, I'm proud to be Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski, but more importantly, proud former member of the Maryland House of Delegates. Um, I actually think the conversations you've had to date are pretty instructive, uh, talking about thinking about things differently, talking about innovation, taking what has largely been a crisis to take a step back and a, and a pause to reevaluate and reimagine what workforce can be and what it should be, particularly in a field that you have identified clearly uh, as in need of support and I think was accurately described as on fire by, uh, by Sher Kelly. So um, we really are trying to step forward. I'm very proud of the work that uh, Baltimore County is doing, partnering with our, our friend and friends and ums, and particularly uh, St. Joe's, uh, but also our community college, to really sort of build on the work that you just heard from uh, Ms. Clapp uh, and the nonprofit sector to also have a, a public entity partnering with government to do uh, very similar work. So we really are um, in a very similar way coming together to tackle those traditional challenges that have prevented um, those with the least means access to a job uh, and a workforce that we really need to be filling. So uh, in partnership, we are stepping forward to address the transportation, childcare, training, um, current, even current job restrictions um, that people who want to get in this field might be facing. And uh, we're proud that we have uh, developed this uh, Pathways program. It offers full scholarships for eligibly, eligible uh, financially vulnerable students to participate in our community college's uh, CNA program, eliminating one primary barrier. Um, after graduating, graduates are offered guaranteed employment uh, at UMD St. Joseph Medical Center in Baltimore County, where they will continue their education in practical nursing. Uh, program recipients receive $1,000 per month while enrolled in CCBC to alleviate challenges like childcare, housing, and transportation that might otherwise prevent their success. Uh, we're very excited that UMS and CCBC, and we are also stepping forward, as you were hearing, to also provide other wraparound services to ensure. Uh, we believe that we have to make sure we give all of our residents a fair shot at this work. It's critical that we fill the, the roles, but also that we put people in there who both look like the people that they're serving, but also have the same lived experiences as the people they're helping in the hospital too. So uh, it's been an honor to um, have the opportunity uh, with Delegate Kelly and others to talk about this at the White House, um, to talk about this with leaders from across the country, uh, my peers in jurisdictions across uh, America through the National Association of Counties. Um, in addition to that program, uh, we have $100,000 dedicated to other healthcare pathway scholarships with our community college. So if you're not in this first 30-person pilot that we think really can be a model, um, whether it's government in the private sector or nonprofits, and we actually are happy to be talking to the Dwyer Group about uh, potential partnerships as well. Um, but we think that there's a role for other local governments for the state of Maryland to step in and really both meet the need but also meet it in a way that really is open to all of our, our uh, residents. So it's a win-win for us filling key needs while offering um, our deserving residents an opportunity. Uh, I want to thank uh, my friends, uh, Chris and Jones Bryce and Nicole Beeson from UMS for their partnership. Uh, I want to also thank Dr. Santha for his openness to really find a way to make this happen. Um, I, I think this is going to be transformative. This is the kind of thinking that really I think is going to open opportunities for people that is life changing uh, for them, but also meets critical needs. So I just appreciate the interest and I'll turn it over to the experts. Thank you. Who would like to start? Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Kristen Jones Bryce with the University of Maryland Medical System. Um, appreciate the county executive's testimony, and I think I just want to start by thanking him for his leadership on this issue. Um, uh, you, you all, many of you know him from his time in the General Assembly, but someone who does think outside of the box, and I think this is a really innovative way to deploy ARPA resources um, in the state. So I hope that I'm going to advance these slides. We're not going to go through this PowerPoint, but we wanted to make sure you had something um, left behind from us. If you look at this slide, though, I, I really think that this is a moment that requires a multifaceted approach to, to workforce, and you've heard some of that already today. This really is an opportunity for innovation. Uh, that, that's what we view it as within the University of Maryland Medical System. And in addition to the Pathways program that is truly, again, an innovative program we are very excited about, uh, there are a number of other initiatives that are detailed in this PowerPoint, and if you have a chance, we'd love for you to 
to take a look at them. My colleague, Nicole Beeson, who's the Chief Nursing Officer at St. Joe's, is going is to spend a few minutes on Pathways. And if you would indulge her, Madam Chair, on the ACE program, so the UNS Academy of Clinical Essentials, another really innovative program. Um, we're doing practic practicum to practice, the Nursing Roadmap program that, that tailors sort of individual planning for every single nurse uh, who's interested in it to chart their course professionally and then our, our, also our mentorship program. So I just want to point out that we are taking a multifaceted approach at the system. Um, we, Dr. Santa, Dr. Smythe, all appreciate the opportunity to be here, and this partnership, again, with, the, with Baltimore County, with the county executive, is, is, is uh, truly inspiring. So, And thank you for your work and for your partnership with this committee. Um, and you. for the new members, Ms. Jones, um, used to be the chief of staff to the prior speaker of the house. Um, so she's been around here, highly regarded. I wanna just let the committee know that the slides for this presentation were sent to you, um, so you have them in your email, okay? Because I know they were not earlier. Um, they came a little late. Go ahead. So, so I need a little mea culpa on that because I'm looking at Lindsay, who was very it's not her fault. in telling me. <laughs> it's not her fault. She sent an email on time. I mean, our staff is, let me tell you, top notch. Don't yes. hire them, though, okay? <laughs> I'd so, like to. Please don't. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing us to speak on this really exciting program. My name is Nicole Beese, and I'm the Chief Nursing Officer at UM St. Joe's, and I'm a nurse, and I can say, yes, it's on fire. And I'm really so thrilled for this partnership. And so as we talk about this pathway, there's a couple key elements at the center of all of this. There's a human being in the bed that we're all called to serve. There's the moral distress because we can't meet the demand. There's a community at need. There's citizens in the state that want a pathway out. In fact, I was one of those citizens at one time. And thanks for the program at CCBC, it transformed my life. I sit here in front of all of you, getting ready to finish my doctorate program in nursing. And we want this for others. And so we are innovating. We also understand as we expand this pipeline into hospitals where we will embrace LPNs fully to operate at the top of their scope, we will wrap our arms around them. It is our commitment as an organization and a system because we understand we are anchor institutions and people deserve for us to show up in this way. So it does require this cross-functional commitment to be all in on this. So it's not just about money, it's about commitment, it's about mentorship, it's about services, and it's about the long game. We understand that by opening up these positions within hospitals, it could impact our subacute settings and long-term care assisted living facilities. We heard this today from others. And so in doing that, we understood we needed to expand the pipeline, and that's what this partnership is about. Expanding the pipeline, providing resources, and providing a long-term solution. University of Maryland Medical System has, over the last two years, expanded actual care delivery models. What we're saying is LPNs are here to stay. They are good enough. In fact, they're wonderful. We need them, we want them at the bedside, and the care models will include them. It is our commitment. And so we've embraced this model and expanded it across every member hospital in the whole system. So we're ready to advance this, and we're ready to learn and partner, and we're thrilled to be here today. And if you allow me one additional moment, I will just say you heard about the constraints on entry into nursing school programs. How do we expand that pipeline? And that's the Academy of Clinical Essentials that we're rolling out across the system as well. More than 300 students we've mentored and developed within our organizations with our frontline team members being those preceptors and clinical instructors. In fact, at University of Maryland Shady Grove, they're opening additional 40 spots to nursing students this semester because of this program we're doing through the University of Maryland. And before um, I open it up for questions, is Ms. Jennifer Lynch speaking? Okay, wonderful. Lynch, though, she's our, our workforce expert in Baltimore County, um, and she was just critical in, in helping facilitate some of the conversations with uh, uh, UM, UM St. Joe and uh, um, generally. So I just want to thank her. If there's a technical question, she's here to help, but I want to acknowledge right. her. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Delegate Bandari. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. 
uh, and county executive John you my county executive and would like to commend you for your outstanding leadership in efforts in addressing the workforce crisis um, in our county and providing wonderful leadership uh, to over 800,000 constituents and your dedication to finding solution for this pressing issue is uh, greatly appreciated and I would like to um, ask the question what is your expectations from our committee uh, in your effort to support your excellent vision and efforts that can help Baltimore County and beyond in 2023. I mean, I don't want to speak for my partners here. I, I want to see this taken to scale. I mean, we're going, we're, we are committed to making this work. We're nimble enough that we can make changes as we go along, but this is going to work. And we're going to make sure that we're helping you not only fill critical needs, but we're going to lift some of our most vulnerable residents across Baltimore County and I hope across this state. Um, out, of the, out of their circumstances and into prosperity. And so to the extent this is of interest, um, if you want to track it and monitor it this year, that's fine. If you want to help supercharge it with additional funding, um, OMS was very generous. We're using a significant amount of our federal recovery dollars to help do this as well. Um, but you know, I, I will defer to the wisdom of the committee. I learned that statement a long time ago. Um, but but we want to just keep the lines open and, and just keep telling the story of, of the potential and the promise and the deliverance of, of opportunity through, through this work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you for your time because I know you're very busy. This is really exciting, right? Something that can be replicated um, as well. And I, on behalf of the committee, thank you for all your efforts and for caring because this is a really important issue. I hope you have a blessed day. Don't tell the speaker you were here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just if I may, we haven't advertised this program yet. Just from the news article, we've already had more individuals reach out to our community college to apply for the program than we have slots. Wow. There's been no advertising, wow. just from Impressive. so. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have a blessed day. Ms. Clapp, you are. Is she coming up? You are wonderful for being so patient. And the committee thanks you, and we are all yours now. Are there any questions for Ms. Clapp? There are none, but I want to say on behalf of the committee that you have a very impressive program. Thank you. And thank you for doing business in Maryland. Thank you for having your nonprofit here and for all your partnerships, and that we really appreciate it. Thank you. And feel free to reach out to us if there's anything that we can do, okay? Sure. And I thank you for it. being so kind. Thank you. You have a blessed day. You too. Thank you. Next, we have the overview of Maryland Health Occupations Board, and we have Ms. Kimberly Link, who is back with us. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want um, the representatives from the boards to come up Absolutely. and do it at the same time? Sure. Huh? I'll go ahead and get started since we're pressed on time here. So we have the Maryland Board of Physicians. Um, we have the Maryland Board of Nursing as well. Okay? The, yes. Thank you. And Th good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Who would like to get started? I'll get started, Madam Chairman. Um, good afternoon, everyone, once again. Uh, thank you for having me. My name, again, is Kim Link. I'm with the Maryland Department of Health. I'm a senior advisor to the Secretary on Health Board Matters. And today, we're going to give you an overview on the Health Occupations Boards. For some of you, this is a refresher. For some of you new to the committee, um, this may be your first introduction to the Health Occupation Boards. So um, I will go ahead and started here. Oh, this slide looks like it had a little issue in transferring, <laughs> but um, we have 20 health occupations boards that are within the Maryland Department of Health. You can see here across the screen um, everything from, you know, acupuncture all the way through to social work. Each board um, is they license, they regulate, and they discipline health care providers and their mission is to protect the public. Each board has several things in common. They each have practice acts and regulations, the practice act being the statutes that guide their operations and their mission. They each have an executive director. Each board has administrative and investigative staff. They have assistant attorneys general who serve as uh, board counsel. They each have their own offices, a budget, 
and they each have their own licensing application procedures and platform. Board members are appointed by the governor. They consist of licensees, and most boards have at least two members of the public that serve on each board. Board of Meticians has five public members, but most boards have two. The board members serve four-year terms and may, may serve two consecutive terms. Again, a margin problem, sorry about that. Um, the total active licensees that fall under the health occupation boards total approximately 400,000. The number of the types of licenses, reg registrations, and certificates is about 112, meaning there are 112 different um, licenses, registrations, certificates that are issued by all of the boards in aggregate. If I may, just to make you feel better, we have the slide, so don't worry about okay. it. Continue <laughs> to go through it, but we have it in front of us. <laughs> thank you. It did not look like this at yesterday's briefing, so thank you. Um, the boards, most of them, 17 of the 20, are special funded. That is, they're funded from licensing and other fees, and those fees are set by the boards, and they're set forth in their regulations. Three of the boards um, are general funded. I wanted to point out that about one half of the boards have online initial applications and accept electronic payments. That is, the other half uh, are reliant on paper applications and uh, checks or money orders in order to apply for a license. Happy to say, though, that most boards have online license renewals and accept electronic payment for their renewals. The health occupation boards are considered units of the Maryland Department of Health. And the Secretary of Health has um, the following authority over the units of the boards. Uh, the Secretary may review and revise the rules and regulations proposed by the boards. They, the Secretary um, has the authority to keep informed of the board's plans, proposals, and projects. And the Secretary has the authority to require reporting. There are, however, limitations on the Secretary's authority with respect to the Health Occupation Boards. The Secretary cannot disapprove or modify a decision regarding licensing, discipline, or investigations. The Secretary cannot transfer board staff. The Secretary cannot transfer a function that pertains to licensing, discipline, or enforcement authority. I wanted to point out that with the exception of the Board of Physicians, um, each board's executive director is um, hired and, and by the board itself. And that exec those executive directors report directly to the board chair or the board president. The Board of Physicians executive director is appointed by the Secretary of Health and reports directly to the secretary. So that is a very high level overview of the health occupation boards. I'm happy to take questions, or we may uh, proceed, Madam Chair, to the next presenter, if you'd like. We'll proceed to the next presenter, and then at the end, we will do the questions. Thank Who you. would like to be next? <coughs> I'm going to switch. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam good Vice afternoon. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm Matt Dudzik with the Maryland Board of Physicians. Um, and uh, I, I know I've, I've brought a lot of info with me today, but um, you know, I promise I will keep things moving along, keep we things brief. We will really appreciate it. <laughs> um, so uh, the Maryland Board of Physicians, um, as, uh, as uh, Kim Link mentioned, uh, we are focused on uh, the uh, licensing and discipline of uh, not just physicians, but also 13 other allied health occupations. Um, we've had some form of formal licensure for physicians for over 200 years, um, and a lot has changed over the years, but um, our most important goal is always public protection. Um, and we do that, uh, again, as, as Kim mentioned, through two main arms, um, uh, proactively through licensure, um, just ensuring that you know, the health professionals that we have in this state are qualified, uh, and then reactively through discipline. Um, 
just as a quick outline of our board structure, we have 22 board members. Um, of those 22 board members, 14 are physicians. Uh, we also have five consumer members, just members of the public that don't have any association with, with the health fields. Uh, and then we have some other, uh, other folks. I break it down in detail on the slides. Um, but uh, they are nominated by a, a wide variety of, of groups. Uh, among those physicians, uh, we represent a broad array of specialties, so that would include emergency medicine, psychiatry, internal medicine, OBGYN, and more. Um, how, uh, one way that our board is structured a bit differently from a lot of the other health occupations boards uh, is that we are broken into two separate 11 member disciplinary panels. Um, this was actually first done back in 2014 as a way to address some uh, backlog in processing investigations and complaints. Um, this, um, it, it's been very successful. Uh, it allows us to more quickly, pro um, more quickly process complaints, resolve those investigations, and deal with any pending issues. Uh, so as you can see here, the disciplinary panels uh, directly handle all disciplinary matters. Um, so rather than having to convene the full board to move something to the next stage of an investigation, we're able to bring it to one of the two disciplinary panels, which meet twice as frequently as the full board. Um, so we have multiple disciplinary meeting, uh, panel meetings a month. Um, the full board still handles uh, things such as you know, policy and legislative decisions. Uh, they appoint the committee members for uh, the, uh, our many allied health committees. Um, they approve and disapprove uh, things such as you know, advanced duties for, for physician assistants. Uh, but those disciplinary, man um, disciplinary matters go before those individual panels. Um, our core duty, of course, is uh, licensure. Uh, we are the second largest health occupations board in Maryland. Uh, we license over 50,000 providers. Um, by far, the greatest percentage of those providers uh, are physicians. Uh, we have over, over 35,000 licensed physicians. Um, and then we um, you, uh, also regulate a number of other professions, uh, physician assistants, of course, um, and um, quite a number of others that are listed here. We are also uh, in the process of rolling in genetic counselors uh, to begin li uh, issuing licenses to genetic counselors in 2024. Um, as far as uh, our license terms, they are all on biennial terms with fixed renewal stages. Uh, one minor quirk of that, um, and we get this question a lot, uh, is that uh, we, um, while we try to distribute those renewal terms as evenly as possible, uh, we do receive significantly more renewals in um, even year, or I'm sorry, in odd years than we do in even years. Uh, so frequently on even years, there's a noted drop in our board revenue and a noted drop in uh, renewals. So you can see we had 17,000 and change renewals in fiscal year 2022, uh, but in fiscal year 2021, we had close to 29,000 renewals. So it's, it's obviously, it's, it's a significant difference. Um, it is not representing a drop in, um, in renewals overall. Uh, in fact, those have actually been, been rising and our, our number of licensed practitioners has been rising overall. Um, but uh, if you ever you know, have questions as to why there are some dramatic shifts from year to year, that is why. Uh, <clears throat> one requirement for all licensees since 2016 is that we obtain criminal history record checks from every licensee across the board. Um, the, um, these are basically you know, criminal background checks that we receive from the Court Judiciary Information System as well as the federal government. Um, I, I do want to note that committing a crime is not a barrier to licensure. Um, we specifically look at crimes of moral turpitude and crimes that directly relate to the practice of medicine. Uh, it, uh, as you can see here, you know, in, in the past fiscal year, uh, we had 166 positive criminal history record checks, but none of them actually resulted in a denial of a license application. Um, as far as um, expediting licenses is concerned, uh, there's uh, three main reasons why we might expedite a license. Uh, the first is for our military. Uh, through the Veterans Full Employment Act of 2013, uh, we automatically expedite licenses for service members, veterans, and military spouses. Uh, there's a, a checkbox in the application. Um, if you select that, your, um, your application essentially goes to the top of the list. And we have staff that will specifically kind of shepherd that application through the process to make sure it goes through as quickly as possible. 
Uh, we also expedite licenses for reasons of urgent public health requests. Um, so for example, if a hospital reaches out to us saying that they need a certain number of individuals licensed in a very short time frame in order to meet staffing ratios, uh, we will do everything we can to accommodate that request. Uh, we saw this uh, especially frequently, um, we saw a lot of these requests uh, at right as Governor Hogan's emergency orders were expiring. There were a number of uh, individuals from out of state that were practicing under those emergency orders. Um, with the expiration of those orders, we needed to get quite a lot of individuals licensed in Maryland so that they could continue to practice uninterrupted. Um, and so that all went through uh, as expedited requests. And those requests can come from hospitals. Uh, sometimes we've, you know, uh, Maryland Hospital Association has uh, reached out to us, other state agencies, um, and we always uh, do what we can to get those accommodated. Um, and then uh, more recently, we've implemented an expedited pathway to licensure uh, known as licensure by endorsement. Uh, this just went live about three weeks ago. Um, this is essentially um, a process that shifts the burden of credentialing from, uh, for individuals that are licensed in another state uh, with the same requirements as Maryland. It shifts those credentialing burdens from the applicant to the board. Uh, the credentialing process is by far the most time-consuming process of the, the whole application period. Um, and um, because they've already met these credentialing requirements in other states, we allow those states to endorse that they've met those requirements, and we perform the credentialing steps rather than having the applicant do so. Uh, we did a soft rollout about three weeks ago. We've already had 21 completed applications. Um, we um, you know, wanted to do a soft rollout first just to make sure there were no bumps in the road, but it seems to be working well, so we'll do a, a broader rollout as, as we go on. Um, in addition to licensure by endorsement, we also have a couple of other licensure pathways. Uh, the Interstate uh, Medical License Compact is something I know this committee knows quite a bit about. Uh, we've issued over 900 licenses through that compact. Uh, we are also part of the uh, uniform application process. Um, that is a... Um, it's a, di a standardized digital application uh, that was developed by the Federation of State Medical Boards. Uh, we were part of the pilot program in participating in this, um, but it essentially allows you to, if, if you're applying, you can apply to any of the participating states through that one standardized application. Right now there are 26 participating states. Um, there's no additional cost in Maryland. There's a small fee that goes to the Federation of State Medical Boards, but we've reduced our license fees by that same amount accordingly so that it's the same fee that you would pay if you were an in-state resident. Uh, oh, and actually I do want to, before I move on from that, uh, did want to mention one thing that's not on the slide that we are very proud of, which is that we are in the process of entering into a reciprocity arrangement with uh, the District of Columbia and Virginia. Um, that is something we've been working very hard toward. Uh, it, we were hoping to have it go live in January. It's, uh, we've, we are ready on our end. Uh, the, we had a request from the other jurisdictions to delay rollout until February, but hopefully that will be live very soon. And, and we're very happy to offer that because we know that there's a lot of movement uh, between those jurisdictions right now. Um, we uh, have a, an internal goal of issuing 95% of our licenses within 10 days of the completed application. Um, and we have uh, not just met, but consistently exceeded those goals over the past several years. Um, we, uh, in fact, it, it typically, once we get the, that completed documentation, uh, we can typically issue the license in under 48 hours. Um, you, um, you can see some of the figures from recent years here. Uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, cybersecurity incident at the end of, of 2021, I don't currently have figures for fiscal year 22. Uh, that being said, we have still cons uh, consistently met our licensure timeframes. So I am confident that even in fiscal year 2022, uh, throughout the network incident, we are still uh, ahead of that 95% figure, uh, and hopefully we'll have you know, exact, uh, exact figures on that soon. Um, and then uh, we get a question a lot about why a license might be delayed, especially given that you know, we, we do everything to keep these moving as quickly as possible. Uh, far and away the most common reason is that the application is incomplete. Um, sometimes that may mean that uh, it's something that the applicant has failed to do, uh, but uh, we require primary source verification, um, and so sometimes that can actually mean that it's, it's that one of the verifying entities has failed to send us the uh, relevant credential. Uh, we also run into that with the criminal history record checks. Uh, mostly the, that process is, has, is running relatively smoothly now, but especially for out-of-state licensees because they have to send those fingerprints to Maryland, uh, sometimes there, there can be a delay in that. There is a statute 
statutory requirement that we can't issue the license until we receive that criminal history record check. Um, but uh, those are generally the reasons why a license might be delayed. In rare cases, something in the application may trigger the investigative process, um, which of course would also lead to a delay in licensure, but those are, those are not uh, nearly as common. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into great detail on our disciplinary process. Uh, just, I'll just say that we have three disciplinary stages. Um, we open a preliminary investigation first. Uh, that preliminary investigation can never result in charges. Uh, it is essentially a, an investigation meant to determine if we should proceed with a full investigation. Goes to one of those disciplinary panels I'd mentioned previously. Uh, if they choose not to close the case, we will then bring it to a full investigation. Uh, come back before the board. Um, when the board agrees, or the disciplinary panel agrees on, on moving forward with charges, uh, we always try to resolve this through a dispute resolution conference and enter into a consent order with the physician or uh, other health practitioner. Uh, in cases where that's not possible, of course, it would be forwarded to the Office of the Attorney General uh, for prosecution uh, and then go before the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, the um, Complaints that we uh, receive can come from a wide variety of sources. Uh, the most common uh, of those sources is from a patient or family member. Uh, that accounts for roughly 60% of the complaints we receive. Um, you also may see sometimes a complaint that will be listed as a board referral. Uh, that typically means, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, that something in the uh, application process triggered an investigation. So perhaps it's that um, you know, there was a discrepancy between one of their uh, verifying documents and their application. We have to investigate that. Um, almost 80% of our complaints allege either unprofessional conduct or failure to meet standard of care. Um, that just is, is the vast majority of the complaints we receive. Um, the next highest after that uh, are complaints alleging a failure uh, involving uh, medical records, uh, which accounts for about 7% of our complaints. Um, I do want to touch on standard of care allegations a little bit because that's something that's not covered in the Medical Practice Act. That is intentional. Standard of care is evolving and should be evolving um, over time. Uh, so um, we, uh, whenever we receive an allegation involving standard of care, it is forwarded to two independent peer reviewers, and they must agree that uh, standard of care was not met for a case to proceed to charges. Um, I won't go into the statistics on board actions. They are there for you, and I'm happy to answer questions, both here or offline. Um, but, um, uh, and then these slides are talking about mandated reporting. So this is specifically uh, reporting that hospitals are required to make, uh, hospitals and other facilities are, are required to make to the board um, just so that we are aware when there is a termination of privileges, for instance. Um, but um, I, again, happy to answer questions uh, in the interest of time. I'll, I'll kind of move on from there. Uh, we do work very hard to have a website that uh, makes things as transparent as possible. Um, that would include uh, disciplinary alerts, uh, but it also uh, includes full rosters of our physicians with a wide variety of information. Um, the, those rosters are updated monthly. Um, we make those publicly available for anybody who, who goes onto our website. Um, and you can see here, it's, it's not just of, of physicians, but uh, also of things such as acupuncture registrations for the physicians who have that, drug dispensing permits, et cetera. Uh, we also have a, a wide breadth of information on our practitioner profiles. Uh, if you wanted to know if a practitioner accepts Medicaid, if you wanted to know if they'd received any malpractice judgments in the past 10 years, all of that is information that we have online. Um, we've actually received some, some kudos from a uh, national organization uh, about the uh, amount of information that we make available for our, uh, on our practitioner profiles, so we're very proud of that. Um, and it's, it's available right from the, you know, you go into our website, it's a big blue button, you can't miss it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we also share data with some other, uh, um, other agencies, which are listed here. I know that, that uh, workforce data has been a, a big, uh, a big uh, topic of conversation before this committee. Um, and, you know, we, we do uh, sit on the work group that uh, presented here earlier. Um, but that uh, covers, uh, that, that is a, a brief overview of, uh, of the Board of Physicians, and you know, we're happy to answer any questions both here and online. Thank you, and that was wonderful, 15 minutes. Well done. <laughs> All right, let's see if you can follow that. Good afternoon. And you can get started. Okay, thank you. Our um, pleasure. Thank you. Um, 
Chair Payne Melnick and um, Vice Chair Kelly and committee members. Thank you for having the Board of Nursing here. Um, a lot of things that both Matt and Kim spoke about, I won't repeat. Um, so just giving you some highlights for the Board of Nursing. We are the largest board in the state of Maryland. We um, currently have 200 and over 281,000 um, active um, practitioners under the board. That includes um, both licensure and certification. We also have the largest number of designations, which is 16, and all of them are listed there. Um, the, the, we do have three distinctions amongst our board, but I want to focus on two. Um, the first is that the board hires nurse investigators to research practice standards and investigate complaints. And the second is the board is the only board that approves educational programs on the nursing level um, as far as licensure concern, as well as for um, multiple disciplines in the allied health arena. There's several reports um, in recent publications on the Board of Nursing. I will leave that for you to look over, but they do um, outline some of the obstacles that have been faced by the board. Um, the first is insufficient um, number of personnel capacity to meet our need, meet the um, constituents' needs, excuse me. And currently we have 33 openings at the Board of Nursing. We, um, technology, um, at that can track the incoming calls and emails. Um, our technology is over 20 years old. Um, it's not in the cloud. And we had requested this back in 2019. We have worked with the Department of Informational Technology in June of 2019, and then Kelly came, and that slowed things down a little bit. Um, but what happened at the end of that is that it was a cost that we could not afford. It was over $5 million. The original price was $9 million. Um, the existing fee structure at the board cannot adequately support our operations and fiscal responsibilities. We have not been able to increase our fees since 2008. That was a mandate by the previous governor. Um, had an email out in 2016. And then um, when I asked for a rate increase from our constituents, it was not allowed at that time. Just to give you what our staff is facing is um, we have seven licensed uh, personnel for licensure. Each of them regulate um, over 46,000 individuals. One of our major concerns right now is the Complaints and Investigation Department. Um, it's staffed by three nurse um, investigators, one non-nurse investigator, and one non-nurse investigator in training. The Director of uh, and Management of Enforcement are included as experienced um, investigators as well. So the Director has at least 600 cases, and the manager assigned has 500 cases. Um, we have approximately 3,000 cases that are outstanding, and we have 2,000 um, cold cases as well. That was prior to 2017. Um, to, in order for us to meet our full capacity, we need an additional 20 investigators and four administrative employees in that particular area is extremely crucial right now with all of the things that are going on out in the country. Um, we have our priority one cases, which are the <coughs> um, most horrific cases, have increased over the last three months. Um, our funding source, um, we're the second from the lowest as far as um, 906,000, over 906,000, which per practitioner is 322. Um, one of the areas that we would like to do is to be able to um, receive funds um, from other sources, such as grants. Right now, um, Health Occupations Article 8-206 restricts the board from receiving funds from any other agency. 
and we would like to be able to open that up so we can receive grants to assist our operations. I spoke to you about the technology. Um, and again, we operate with two systems. One is Lars, one is Milo. Um, as far as Milo is concerned, I mean, as Lars is concerned, um, Lars is our online system. What the team has to do is manually transfer that data over to Milo, which takes a lot of uh, time. Um, to date, we have tried to um, upgrade our system, and again, that was not allowed. And one of the areas of our most concern is our call uh, phone system. We receive numerous calls a day, but there are times that we cannot call each other inside. Um, and when I go to reach out to a constituent, I am unable sometimes to make that phone call. Over the last two years, we have increased the trunk size of our phone calls. And um, it was 21 year and 30 the following year. And so it looks like we have to do that again. Um, so one of the areas, I just want to address a couple of things that I've, I've heard throughout. One thing that um, we're most proud of is our partnerships that we have created over the past five years. Um, you've heard of one earlier with the Maryland Hospital Association. That has definitely been a win-win for, I think, both of us, um, as well as with the deans and directors. Um, what we do during that time is we create solutions to problems that have come up. Um, they're incremental in steps, but we are getting there. The next is um, MHEC and the community colleges, APCAP, for the um, CNA programs, and we have a continued relationship with the Maryland Nurses Association. Additionally, um, I work closely with the National Council of State Boards of Nursing and with our sister state to make sure that um, we bring in workforce um, strategies to help us out. Additionally, for the National Advisory Council and on nursing education and practice, that's also workforce generated, and I'm allowed to bring those workforce strategies back here to Maryland. Um, just for a point of information, um, the board is working with two schools of nursing. They are looking at uh, one to have an LPN to bridge program, and the other is to develop an LPN program. So we have been working closely to help them be able to do that. Next, which is also um, we're excited about, we have been working with the um, Welcome Back Center with Carmen Sanchez. And this year, we have approved four additional English language proficiency so that we can assist with the um, immigrant issue that is there. And we also put that in for on November 3rd for emergency regulations so that we can get that through as fast as we possibly can. Currently, we have one credentialing center for foreign um, students as far as the nursing school, that's CGFNS. Um, the board has, is allowing me to open that up and to be able to look for more credentialing that will add to, will give the um, applicant more choices in order to um, present to the board their um, application. Other items that we've done this year is put through emergency reg on temporary nursing regulation, um, which was a success with that. I also was able, along with the Office of Healthcare Quality, we were able to um, get a waiver from CMS for the long-term care community so that they're able to test and we've met with them several times. Currently, we're working with dialysis tech stakeholders um, so that we can get those regulations in, and I would like to put those through as emergency regulations as well. Um, the, as far as our IT system goes, um, I would like um, to look at the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, currently 12 states are using that system. It's a free system, which really helps out our particular budget. Um, and one thing about this system 
that is awesome is that after the individual uh, applicant takes the exam, they will be a, uh, their um, results come to us directly that same day, as opposed to how it is right now, which is three to four days until we actually get that information from Pearson View. Secondly, which I think will be a win-win for the, our constituents, is that they will be able to look to see the status of their application online. And third, which is most important, we will be in the cloud. So if we ever go through ransomware or, um, or pandemic again, we hope we never have to do that again. But if we do that, then um, we, won't be, we will be safe and be able to, to work. A couple of things that we would like to suggest um, as I end this is that we would like to streamline the um, onboarding process for new employees. So our, our recommendation is if we could get um, the larger boards and a representative from the small boards to work with HR and DBM to see how we can um, streamline that process, uh, that would be great. As far as procurement, the same thing with the same group, um, that would be great. We also would like to be able to provide competitive salaries. We just lost two individuals because of our salary cap that we have. Um, the, um, additionally, um, we would like to look at our class specifications because some of the class specifications does not meet what we need. So we have been working with DVM on that as well. Um, and those are the major changes. <laughs> and so I welcome any questions that you have. Ms. Evans, before I go into questions, there are actually two other individuals, um, Ms. Scott and Mr. Hicks. Are they yes. going to speak? Or? No, I, okay. because of timing. All right. We want to respect your, your wish, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I am going to open it up for questions. First, I have Delegate Kerr, followed by Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is for Kimberly Link. I was first amused and then alarmed when you told me how many of the boards still use paper. Uh, um, we get uh, calls from constituents often uh, asking us if we can do anything to help them, to help expedite their licensure process. Is this, does that contribute to the, to the lack of time? Is there anything that the boards of health are looking at to, to have some standardized technology? We heard from the nursing board that it's cost prohibitive. So um, is there a move towards some technology standardization? Thank you, Delegate Kerr. Actually, um, the Department of Information and Technology performed a study last year, perhaps the year before at this point, to study um, putting all of the boards on the one-stop platform, which was you know, um, a goal of the prior administration, was to have all, all the licensing boards on one platform. I do it, publish that study. And um, former Secretary Schrader actually offered the boards the, oppor the opportunity that the department would cover the cost of implementing that system. No boards have took him up on that offer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Then I have Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the question's for Karen. You just spoke of losing a couple nurses because of a salary cap. So are you, do you know where you lost them to? Is this to, like, the traveling nurses? I know... They're making quite a lot of money at the moment. And how many nurses are you losing to become travel nurses? Um, for the board, for the nurses that are on our board, we are losing them to any other uh, health care agency within the state of Maryland. Um, so, you know, on the average, the salary is 87000 where they can go out and work for 100000 Okay. All right, thank you. Thank You're you, Madam You're very Chair. welcome. My pleasure. Delegate Shalega. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm a little I'm um, concerned and I guess perplexed. Why, if Governor Hogan offered to pay the boards to upgrade, wh what was the answer for not taking them up on that? Um, the offer didn't go through. We never, well, I can only speak for the Board of Nursing. 
Um, yes, he did offer it at one time, and then it was taken away as far as on our, you know, it wasn't there the whole time. So we didn't get that offer. I, I'd like to, um, yeah. Well, and I, I can say that, yes, he did offer it. We all were in a meeting. Ms. Link was in that meeting as well when they offer it, and then it didn't go anywhere past that point. Okay. So it wasn't that the board said no. The board did not say no. But they didn't say yes either. So, um, but I'm also curious what the, um, the Board of Physicians, Matt, said in his slide, 95% um, of the licenses are approved within 10 days. Yes. What's the Board of Nurses, Board of Nursing turnaround? It depends. It depends, one, if we have a complete application. Um, I would say right now, due to our lack of staffing, uh, we can't always meet. Usually, um, last summer, um, it was... I should say the summer of 2021, um, we were able to do that within 10 business days or less. But right now, we are down 30% of our staff. And I am licensing as the executive director. Um, we're all pitching in so that we can get the licensings completed, you know, as fast as we possibly can with the limitations that we have. Yeah. Well, I, I personally want to thank you. You've helped with a couple of my constituent cases, as Delegate Kerr has mentioned, and we hate, you know, pushing them to you, but we're well, urging I, you to solve this problem because it, well, it's a, as you, I don't have to tell you, it's, yes. it's a problem. And thank one, you. Yes, and thank you for that. And one of the ways to solve the problems for us to get a new IT system. Yeah. Um, and again, we have one that is free, low cost to the board that we can implement right now. Um, with do it, it would take three to five years to implement that. And for me, my constituents need it as soon as possible. That's who I'm concerned about because if we're able to get our constituents out, I mean, get their license completed, then they can get out in the workforce. Yeah. So I'm very passionate about that because they mean a lot to me. And I want to be able, because when they serve, then they serve our patients. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Delegate Taveras. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, all of you. I mean, frankly, there's a lot. The challenges seem very critical that are facing the system. So um, have any of, has there been any consideration in, at one time, you know, I'm from New York, so we 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 sh we did a huge push to try to attract nurses from the Philippines, from Jamaica, Panama, um, and I do think that uh, we could do the same with El Salvador and some of the more uh, present um, cultures that we have. Um, here, so has any consideration been made to do something like that to try to also close that gap? We are doing that. Um, we're getting um, applicants from all over the world <laughs> right now. And so, yes, as long as um, what they need is a sponsor from one of the healthcare facilities, um, and we're very open to helping them get through that process. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Delegate Kipke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My pleasure. Just a quick question. You had mentioned changing the uh, section of the health article to allow for grants and things like that. Uh, I would imagine, like, the hospital association might be really eager to have some remedy to some of these problems. Does that current law prevent, like, the hospital association chipping in to solve problems like this? One, yes. Okay. Thank and you. we would like to open it up. Thank you. Thank you for your. Vice Chair Kelly. Sorry, just a follow up. I wasn't going to ask a question because we're out of time and my bill hearing is next. But um, a Delegate Kipke's question when you say it prevents everyone, does it prevent the Department of Health from helping you? Because 
So, so I, I know we had a conversation in the commission uh, on the Healthcare Workforce Commission about the possibility of the Department of Health taking over some of the administrative functions for the board so that you could focus on your licensing and mm -hmm. disciplinary responsibilities. It sounded in that conversation like you, uh, or maybe your board, the board was, was resistant to that idea. Can you explain why, oh, two things maybe, uh, and I know you can't speak on behalf of your board, but I guess you've had conversations with your board, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> you know, what suggestions does your board have um, for what we could be doing? Uh, you know, I, I had my intern go through the, the requests to my office. It was, since last year, 12 pages long yes. of requests to my office about licensing delays and concerns just from my constituents. Mm -hmm. So what does your board think? And, and I just want to set the tone because I'm asking you this, but you know, I've been here 12 years. I think these problems with the Board of Nursing have been going on about 20 years. So what is your board suggesting is the fix outside of just increasing salaries? What are the other fixes that they're looking at? Well, the one is why we um, suggested streamlining the HR process. For instance, it took me seven months to get my executive assistant. Mm -hmm. I don't like, mean time. to be combated. I'm just I'm hoping we can have a no, productive no, conversation I, I, about the idea that partnering more with the Department of Health could help with streamlining the HR process because of their relationship well, with DBM. Right, and that's why I made the suggestion that we all work together. You know, I, in order for anything to work, we have to work as a team, right? And so we didn't get a lot of that before. I am looking forward to being able to work with Secretary Scott and a collaborative man, you know, collaboratively. And, you know, I think all we want is to be heard and to understand the struggle that we are, we're having. The, the two areas that I spoke about as far as procurement and HR, that's already in the secretary's realm. That has nothing to do with us. We would like to stay, um, and I guess Mr. Hicks can really speak to this better than I, since he is the president of the board. We would like to be non-political. We want to work with everyone, too. And we want to be able to address all needs. And yes, you did have those 12 pages, and um, that's because we don't have staff. My staff has been working weekends, evenings, lots of overtime, because we want to address the problem. Most of the time, um, what we're finding is that we don't get complete applications. There have been a lot of individuals who um, renew their license on the 27th day. And of course, with, check, I mean, with online, with credit cards, everything has to be clear before that license is issued. Um, so in, in complete applications, I think it's the major concern that we have. You're welcome. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your spirit of collaboration, and I want to thank you, just Delegate Schlegeted. You've helped me with a lot of things and on regulations and on um, really important work on the preceptor tax credit, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just really hope we can all look forward to sort of what is the core mission of the board and how can we help you get the disciplinary and the licensing functions working, get you the staff you need to make that happen, mm -hmm. and if we can find a way to share other burdens uh, in a more efficient way, we should be open to that. I, I think that would be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Delegate Kelly. Any other questions? Delegate Chisholm. Thank you. My thank pleasure. you, Madam Chair. And I hate to do this because uh, I know we're trying to move on, but when Delegate um, Kelly was asking a question, it, it came to me, if, if we had the new software in place that we're talking about, the proprietary software, would it help to eliminate a lot of the incomplete applications? What I mean by that, there's, there's obviously platforms where you have to fill it out to move on to the next section. And it, what was the price tag on that, that software? Because I think it, I heard $9 million and then I heard something else. Well, how quickly could it be put into place? So for the Department of, of Technology, that's three to five years. Um, for ORBS, which is what it's called through the National Council, it's free. It's free maintenance. It's free everything. They design the system exactly how we want it. There's already 12 other boards that currently use it. Um, I could definitely get you those um, boards' names and their executive directors. And so you can see how it will... The applicant will know if something's missing, if something's missing. They have access, um, you know, and it will help get the workforce out there. Most importantly, it will be in the cloud. 
um, right now we're on servers. That's right. not working. And, um, you know, the, um, um, Virginia Board of Nursing, we have Milo, but they have an upgraded level of Milo when I went to visit them. It's wonderful. People don't have to wait to put their documents if they have a discipline. That's another holdup because um, we have to have true test documents. They could just load them into the system. We can't do that right now. There's a lot of things that the system will do to be able to streamline this process. And so I have the information. I just need the equipment uh, in order to do that. that May I ask that she sure. share that with Remember the committee? You, yes, absolutely. That would be great if you could share that with the committee. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Um, so there are no further questions. Just for the committee to know, uh, the Board of Nursing sunsets uh, this year, so we have to um, act on it, right? Um, we know that there are a lot of problems um, with the Board of Nursing, and it has been going on for many years, and I've been here 16 years. So that being said, um, I, will, I love the spirit of working together, and as you know, this committee prides itself in bringing everyone to the table and finding consensus and respecting the mission and keeping in mind our constituents. So with that being said, there will be a lot more questions when you come back. Um, I know that there is correspondence that this committee has. Um, there was also an audit that was done this past summer and a, a larger audit that was just uh, actually uh, requested as well. So you'll see a lot of data in there. Um, so we'll be working with you and passing a bill that um, actually um, would transform the board into, for example, what we did with the Board of Physicians, which had similar um, issues. And this committee and the Senate came together, and we were able to restructure it and make it work where it functions beautifully so that our constituents do not wait in line for three hours, that they can call and get someone to return a phone call. I know it's been um, overwhelming. I mean, we, we lived through COVID, and we appreciate all your efforts, but we want to give you help, and, um, and we want to work with you um, and with a new administration, um, but we do need to make some changes. Um, so just to let you know that it's coming and that you're welcome to sit with us um, to be able to work on it um, as well. I want to thank the committee for your patience while we went through the briefings. I want to thank everyone that came here. We, I hope you felt respected, you felt heard, because we were giving you 100% um, of, our, of our attention. Next, we're going to go straight into our first bill hearing of the session, which is actually House Bill 214. And House Bill 214 is being sponsored by Delegate Kelly. Um, and Delegate Kelly, will you be so kind and come up with your panel? And I believe we have uh, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein and Ms. Keisha Davis and Delegate Kelly. Yes, and we're going to close the Zoom room and start a new Zoom room. Okay. So I've been told, because it's our first one, that we have to close, close this Zoom link and open a new one, and we'll get started. And if I may, as a uh, point of personal privilege, I would like to welcome my friend Julie Statland to the committee. Julie, will you get up? And she's an amazing human being. Welcome to the committee, Julie. Lindsay put this presentation together, and she did a great job with the panel. Thank you, Lindsay. And we're waiting.